East Asian values has been sometimes credited with uh, many things, among which is the tremendous rate of growth we have seen in the East Asian economies. I wanted to talk about one aspect of East Asian values. <clears throat> it's sometimes associated with what we might call authoritarian governance. Basically, I want to cover four questions. <clears throat> Are the traditional cultures of East Asia conducive to authoritarianism? Does authoritarian governance yield better economic results? How do, author how does, how do authoritarian regimes last such a long time? You notice East Asia, they, they seem to last forever. And finally, how does Singapore fit in? into this authoritarian model. Looking at this from a more of a management point of view, management of large organizations, management of countries. We see terms like these that you see on the board here, democracy. And, and the word democracy is particularly treacherous because sometimes when things don't go, don't go well, people say, oh, you're not democratic. Actually, democracy often is, of, is a very much abused word. Democracy basically is electoral democracy, meaning you have a vote to elect a government or a set of leaders. You know? It doesn't say anything about authoritarianism. So you could have a liberal democracy or you could have an illiberal democracy. You could have an authoritarian democracy. Are the traditional cultures of East Asia conducive to authoritarianism? Confucianism started during the Zhou Dynasty, which was like 2000. 3,000 to 2,500 years ago. And he was actually preceded by Lao Tzu, who introduced Taoism, which is a bit of a contrast to Confucianism. It's like yin and yang. Confucian is yang and Lao Tzu is yin. Uh, and there was also Buddhism. These are the three main influences in Chinese culture, and in turn, it spread to many parts of East Asia. And Confucianism was really introduced as a set of ethics to help kings and empress to govern the state. Some of the important features of Confucianism were what you Ren Li Yi Zhong Xiao. The first two are the most important. Ren means benevolence, a feeling of love, care for people. Ren. Uh, then there was Li, which is propriety, protocol, proper behavior. Then there was justice, loyalty, and filial piety. But Ren and Li were extremely important. Let's talk about authoritarianism for a minute. I use the word here in a neutral, non-pejorative sense. It denotes strong central power, narrow limits on political freedom. It does not have to involve repression. And you could have benevolent authoritarianism. In other words, very authoritarian uh, style of governance a lot of concentration of power at the top, limited political freedom, but it could be benevolent. So authoritarianism is actually very natural to good management. I'm not trying to justify that, you know, uh, that authoritarianism is good, but I'm just pointing out that it's something that comes very naturally to human beings and to the animal kingdom. So why over thousands of years of history, the norm has been authoritarianism, kings, caliphs, shoguns, warlords, that has been the, the way people were ruled. You know? So in that sense, we shouldn't be apprehensive of authoritarianism. It is fairly natural to human beings and to animals in the animal kingdom. But it can, of course, go wrong. And it has gone wrong in many places. Now, Confucianism and authoritarianism are often linked together. Why? Because if you look at the way Confucian ethics is taught, preached, it encourages respect for authority. It uh, encourages respect for hierarchy. It also encourages benevolence, means kings and leaders must be kind. They must show compassion. Leaders saw Confucianism, not necessarily 
as a tremendously moral code of behavior, but as a very powerful political weapon, political tool. Because by, in, by having people imbibe Confucianism, immersed in Confucian values, they become a lot more controllable, much more governable, and much more dependable in how they would react. Second question is that I wanted to pose today. Is it true that authoritarian governance leads to better economic results? Among the great, more important proponents of this idea is a great scholar, Harvard, head of Harvard's Chinese philosophy department, Tu Weiming. He argued very convincingly <laughs> that if you look at the successful East Asian economies, which included Asia, uh, Japan, Korea, China, <coughs> China a little later, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan. There was government leadership in the market economy. You know, the government didn't just stand back and say, let the free market work. It was active intervention. There is indeed serious, systematic, planned meritocracy in China. And you don't get to important positions, top positions, by, just by connections or by being parachuted. And Eric Lee's basic point is that because of this, China's economic progress has been tremendous. It is because of this authoritarian meritocratic structure. Wang Yashen goes on to finally give his take on this issue, which is that the real edge that China has had over India was nothing more than human capital. If you look at the educational levels, of the Chinese and the Indians, the Chinese were far better educated, much higher literacy rate, and it was human capital that really gave China the edge, not democracy, and not authoritarianism, nor infrastructure that comes from authoritarianism. My view is this, that it is largely a waste of time in most situations, and it includes trying to account for economic success to look for causal explanations. Joseph Needham posed this question. Why is that China, which used to be the top technology, science and technology country in the world, this was true in around the Song Dynasty, what happened to China? Why did it not have a scientific revolution that Europe had? Until Needham's good friend came along, called, a guy called Nathan Sivin. He was, a, he was also a sinologist, also a philosopher. And he said to Joseph Needham, Joseph, you're asking a stupid question. There is no reason why one country achieves something another country doesn't. Everything is the result of a confluence of many factors. Every event that happens in the world is in fact a perfect storm. It would not have happened if all these things didn't happen together. Now, my third question. Why do authoritarian regimes last such a long time? And there was actually a BBC program that I happened to listen to some months ago, and I thought it was interesting for me to pull out some points from that. One of the great tools of authoritarian regimes, dictatorial regimes, is they use repression, violate human rights, arrest your opponents, throw them into prison, charge them with all kinds of things. Well, the example given in this was Azerbaijan, which has been very repressive. And the regime has stayed a long time. Now, the second characteristic of long-lasting dictatorships or authoritarian regimes is basically buy loyalty. Keep a small group of trusted people, reward them so well, they cannot afford to defect. Interestingly, the third one is called the only game in town, which is like saying belonging to the regime is the only game in town. Meaning, if you don't belong to the regime, you're going to find it very hard to make it. But if you belong to the regime, you can run for office, gain political position, and it is the fastest way to material rewards. My final question is, 
how does Singapore fit in? What are we? Are we an authority regime? And what is in store for us? People cling on to paradigms that they are used to. They don't like the new paradigm. Now, why do I talk about paradigm shift? Because it applies also to political systems. We have a Singapore paradigm today. One could call it the Lee Kuan Yew paradigm. He has enunciated it very well. We know what it's about. You know, strong, authoritarian rule, benevolent. But that paradigm came about at a time when the founding fathers were driven by nation building. That's how we have come to where we are today. Uh, the question is, is it time for a change in the paradigm? Do, do we need a new paradigm? How Singapore should be government? And what should that paradigm look like? <laughs>